All right, before we get started, for folks online, can you just help me with a little sound check? Will you put into chat that you can hear my voice? We'll give everybody a sec there. All right. I just wanted to thank everybody for being here um, at our last seminar of the academic year. My name is Cinnamon Moffitt. I'm the research program manager here at Oregon State University's Hatfield Marine Science Center. Um, and Thank you for being here at Science on Tap. Uh, this is a hybrid event. That means that we have folks online and folks in the room. Uh, for folks online, if you have any technical issues, our volunteer Roseanne, hi Roseanne, um, will help us resolve any of those. So go ahead and put those questions into the chat box and we will get those fixed for you if we can. Um, that's also the place where you can put any questions for our speakers tonight. Uh, we'll be working through those questions at the end of today's presentation. For those folks in the room, we are once again lucky enough to have food and drink in the room. Yay. Um, but I ask if you spill or drop anything to go ahead and raise your hand and let Miguel know. Miguel has a cleanup bucket there that can help keep the red wine off of our light colored floor to the best of our ability. So thanks everybody for being a part of that. Um, again, because this is a hybrid event for folks in the room, if you have questions for our speakers here at the end of the presentation, please just raise your hand and I'll bring a mic to you. That way folks online can hear. I also wanted to let folks know that tonight's presentation is being recorded and will be posted on the past seminar page uh, for Hatfield in a few days. So if you have somebody who wasn't able to join us, you are welcome to share that link with them. A um, couple of things I just wanted to make uh, you aware of. Um, like I said, this is our last Science on Tap, but we'll start them again in the fall. You can go to our events page um, on the Hatfield website and see all the details about any of our events that we might have. Um, so you're welcome to kind of keep track of what we're up to. Um, but while you're all here tonight, I just want to do a quick introduction of um, our first speaker of the evening. Alyssa um, Conley Rendoza is here to talk about her work. She is the Oregon Coastal works with the Oregon Coastal Management Program of the Oregon Department of Land Conservation and Development as the 2022-2023 Natural Resource Policy Fellow. Uh, Alyssa's primary responsibility is focusing on coastal communication in relation to ecology, culture, and history of Oregon's beaches and dunes. She graduated from Ryder University with a bachelor's in marine science and a master's in environmental science and management from Portland State University. Um, she's deeply interested in the environment and ecology and is particularly intrigued by how coastal resource intrigued by the interactions between coastal resources and the people that use them. So I'm going to hand this off to her. Making sure everyone can still hear me. Oh, thank you. <laughs> thank you. Everyone can still hear me. Excellent. Um, Thank you, OSU, for inviting me for this event and extending it a little bit longer. I greatly appreciate it. We're going to start off this presentation with a land acknowledgement. Indigenous tribes and bands have been with the lands that we inhabit today throughout Oregon and the Northwest since time immemorial and continue to be a vibrant part of Oregon today. We would like to express our respect for the first peoples of, the, of this land, the nine federally recognized tribes of Oregon, Burns Paiute Tribe, Confederated Tribes of Coos, Lower Umpqua and Silusla Indians, Confederated Tribes of Grand Ron, Confederated Tribes of Siletz Indians, Confederated Tribes of Umatilla Indian Reservation, Confederated Tribes of the Warm Springs Reservation, Coquel Indian Tribe, Cow Creek Band of the Umpqua Tribe of Indians and the Clackamas Tribes. It is important that we recognize and honor the ongoing legal and spiritual relationship between the land, plants, animals, and people indigenous to this place we now call Oregon. The interconnectedness of the people, the land, and the natural environment cannot be overstated. The health of one is necessary for the health of all. We recognize the pre-existing and continued sovereignty of the nine federally recognized tribes who have ties to this place and thank them for continuing to share their traditional ecological knowledge and perspective on how we might care for one another and the land so it can take care of us. We commit to engaging in a respectful and successful partnership as stewards of these lands. And we are obliged by state law and policy that we will uphold government to government relations 
to advance strong governance outcomes supportive of the tribal self-determination and sovereignty. Now with that, I'm gonna share with you a little bit about the Department of Land Conservation and Development, also abbreviated with DLCD. For those who may be a little bit less familiar with it, it is a small state agency and it supports the implementation of the state's comprehensive land use planning program in Oregon. Under the statewide land use planning program, each city and county must adopt a comprehensive plan consistent with requirements of the 19 statewide planning goals. These goals cover processes, transportation, natural resource protection, growth management, and coastal areas. And for those of you that can see, we actually just celebrated our 50th anniversary, hence why I'm wearing the shirt. Um, <laughs> Now, DLCD also leads the implementation of the Oregon Coastal Management Program, also known as OCMP. Um, this was approved by NOAA, the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration, in 1977. And what OCMP focuses on is the coastal region. So within this jurisdiction, we cover the 362-mile-long coastline. There's 22 major estuaries, eight counties, 33 cities. It includes the territorial sea, and this range includes from going all the way out to three nautical miles offshore and up to the crest um, coastal or mountain line. Now, OCMP helps implement four of the 19 goals. Each of those four goals covers a unique type of environment. So as we can see, goal 16 covers estuarine resources. Goal 17 focuses on coastal shorelands and goal 18, beaches and dunes, goal 19, ocean resources. For this presentation, I'll be focusing on goal 18 so we can better understand not only the ecology of Oregon beaches and dunes, but also the recent history and why there are certain implementations of policies and regulations when it comes to development along the Oregon coast. As some of you may have discovered, the Oregon coastline is a very diverse environment. We can see rocky shorelines, sandy beaches, very, and everything else in between. Something to focus on is that roughly 72% of the coastline is sandy beaches. That's what makes Goal 18 essential for future land use and development. However, let's also note that what we see today is the influence of not only natural events from hundreds and thousands of years ago, but also human or anthropogenic influences in recent years. In fact, it was thought that over thousands of years ago is that so many things have shifted and there used to be naturally forming islands off of Oregon's coastline. Now, this may seem a little bit silly, but we do need to define exactly what a beach is. And I'm sure all of you have a very general definition but as far as for what the state identifies and what a beach is, it's a gently sloping area of loose material that extends landward from the low water line to a point where there is a definitive change in material type or land form. So we have one example where we would identify the beach. Another change in land form could be established vegetation. And that's where we would identify where the beach begins and ends. So with that knowledge, I'd like people to take a moment, see if you can get an idea as far as where the beach would end on the landward side of it. So we know that it starts with the low water line. Have your moment. Do you think you were right? Good. Now let's realize that this is where the beach is in this moment that this photo was taken. The Oregon coastline is continuously changing seasonally, daily, and also over long-term. Now, we are a little bit more familiar with beaches, and maybe some folks are a little bit less familiar with dunes and where we can find them. We can find them in a range of locations globally, and we can find them in a range of locations throughout our nation. Most popularly, as far as within Oregon, we have the Oregon Dunes National Recreational Area in Reedsport. Now, what the state defines to be a dune is a geographical landform of a hill or ridge that's developed by sand or sediment. Now, this sand or sediment is brought in in two main ways, either from wind 
or from water. And in this case, we have ocean currents that are help bringing in that sediment. Now, when it comes to a dune, it might seem silly, but we actually have parts or components to a dune. We have the frontward facing side or the one that's most exposed to the wind. It's called the fore slope. We have the highest points or the top known as the crest. And then we have our non-windward side, also known as leeward side, which is called the slip phase. And so with that knowledge, I'll give you folks just a couple of seconds, to see if you can identify those three components in this image. If you got it wrong, don't worry, I don't know about it. Now, we need to realize that there's actually several different types of dunes. Um, we won't get into all of them, but we're going to focus on the fore dune, which is the frontmost dune. It's the one that parallels the beach. And it's important because it's the one that's most exposed to a lot of change. Um, and so we actually can identify a fore dune to be of a different stable status. So the image on the left-hand side, we would identify that to be more of an active dune where you know a lot of that sand or sediment can be displaced from a lot of different things, whether it's from a natural event or from human influence. The image on the right-hand side, we would identify that to be more of a conditional and it's a lot more stable, but again, it has predominantly vegetation of grasses. And then there are other dunes that we would identify to just be generally as older, and they would have much more vegetation establishment, such as trees. Now, after the fore dune, what can we see beyond that? And there's a lot of different landforms we can see beyond the fore dune. We can see other dunes follow that, which we would identify as a dune complex. We can see development. In fact, in some places along the Oregon coast, we see development on the fore dune, and we'll get into that later on. And then we can also see some low lying flat areas known as deflation plains and those seasonally flood. So feel as though the room and everyone else joining us online have a better idea and concept as far as how DLCD identifies beaches and dunes. Now let's go into why are they important? Why should we care about these particular landforms? Well, first and foremost is beaches and dunes, they help absorb a lot of wave energy or activity. You can see with the image on the left-hand side, a lot of that wave action is more so being placed into the landform versus the image on the right-hand side, which is of a hard structure or of a wall. And we see the wave action reflect. Now for this, you might consider that to be more so of a minor inconvenience for those who are standing along the walkway. However, there's other areas where if we have enough wave action that's being reflected, it can really impact that particular area or adjacent areas of that hard structure. Another important component to beaches and dunes is they do help reduce the erosion rate. So that's in case in which usually water comes up and helps displace or wears away a lot of the sediment. And we can see with some of these images, as far as comparing natural landforms, our dune here on the left-hand side, a little bit more of an opportunity for that sediment to continuously be trapped, even though it's slowly started to erode away, versus the flat hard structure on the right-hand side, where it doesn't give it too many opportunities for sediment to stay stable in that one location. Comparing that to shoreline armoring, which we'll explain, I'll get into that a little bit later on. It can have some of its benefits, but actually we can start seeing with some of these images, shoreline armoring aren't necessarily the long-term solution and they also reduce beach profiles. So although you may have some of the land standing, staying upward, we end up losing some of that beach area that we all wanna have access to. Another important component to beaches and dunes is they are a big proponent to sequestering or absorbing blue carbon. Now, some folks may be less familiar with this because it's deemed as an emerging research, but this is the process in which carbon dioxide is being taken out of the atmosphere and put into these tidal wetlands, such as beaches and dunes. Now, 
We do see this occurring within a lot of other landforms. However, it's been studied and observed that wetland, um, tidal wetlands, excuse me, do this at a rate 10 times higher compared to those inward or landward terrestrial environments. This is important to keep in mind because as the dunes change or shift, again, whether it be from natural events or human influence, that carbon can get released if we're displacing a lot of that sand and it goes back into our atmosphere. Now, among beaches, particularly dunes, we can see various different types of vegetation. This vegetation does help bolster that sequestering of blue carbon. And I'll be focusing on the beach grasses because these grasses have been identified to promote or help with dune growth. Now, the American dune grass, which is a native species, it actually is very slow at establishing and it doesn't capture sand at a quick enough rate, I think, as most people would like it to. Um, which is why in the early 1900s, two different grass species were introduced, seen to promote more of sand capture on dunes. And therefore, the native dune grass has been outcompeted, and we rarely see it on the Oregon coast today. One of those grass species that was introduced is the European beach grass. We can see this all along the Oregon coast, and it's been observed to promote dune height and it establishes quickly and abundantly. That's part of the reason why we're starting to see it very in very high quantities all along the coast. Another introduced species is the American beach grass. So please don't confuse that with the native species that was American dune grass. Um, and with the American beach grass, it's been observed to help with dune width. And we actually see this more predominantly within the northern coast rather than all along the Oregon coast. And with any introduced species, you're bound to find a hybrid, and that's actually what's been produced. It's considered to be relatively new with still research and studies going on as better understanding of what patterns we might see from this particular species, how well we're going to see it distributed along the Oregon coast. What we do know is that it actually helps promote both dune height and width. Now, those two components to a dune are essential, especially when it comes to flooding. With dune height and dune width means less likely for that water to get to those areas beyond the fore dune, which could include either natural areas, public facilities, or even personal and residential development. Now, you might be wondering, how on earth do you tell these beach grasses apart? Excuse me, these grass species apart? Well, we just say, look at the ligule. If you're not sure what a ligule is, it's the tissue at the base of those leaves. And depending upon the length or the height of that ligule, you'll be able to identify that grass species. Here's hopefully a helpful chart for you folks for when you're out there trying to identify your grasses. With our American grasses, that's for both the native dune grass as well as the introduced American beach grass, they're gonna have a really short ligule length, roughly one to two millimeters. The hybrid species is going to have roughly seven millimeter, millimeter length of a ligule, while the European beach grass has the longest ligule length of roughly 25 millimeters. And for those of you who don't have their rulers out and want to have a better idea to identify uh, the two um, American dune grass and beach grass species, our American, um, excuse me, the native American dune grass is roughly one millimeter in length, and that's one paperclip thickness, while the invasive American beach grass is roughly two millimeters in length, and that's two paperclips. I'm sure you folks are quite fascinated by grass species. And if you really want to know more, we actually, there's actually this great um, iNaturalist program to help you identify grasses in which um, DLCD has a couple of partners and experts that help manage this account. For those of you who are less familiar with iNaturalist, this is a free program in which you can sign up and you can help contribute to some community science programs. What essentially you're able to do is you take photos of whatever you might be looking at for this particular group, they're focusing on grass species. 
you provide them with a picture as well as a location, and you'll have an expert that will help identify and confirm that species. So you get to figure out what it is that you're looking at, and you're helping research with some community science information so they can get a better idea in the distribution of these different species along the Oregon coast. Some of the things that you can also include on your iNaturalist, if you'd like, is the wildlife you can see along the Oregon coast. This is another major component to why beaches and dunes are important. We see a wide variety of organisms including invertebrates such as crabs and clams within the sediment, usually close to the beach and shoreline. We can see various type of bird species, those that are here year round, as well as migratory. Up in the vegetation, we can see several different types of insects and bugs that are helper or could be one of the primary consumers of the food chain. And then we can see a range of mammals, anything from small mice and rabbits, to anything as big as an elk, if any of you have been lucky and fortunate enough to see that on, in Oregon. Now, with keeping wildlife in mind, we actually have certain restrictions or regulations on beaches and dunes, and that's because there can be very sensitive organisms or species, such as the western snowy plover. This is considered an endangered species. They're about the size of a golf ball, and they're really hard to see. Um, despite the fact that they do reside in some little vegetation or will have their nest in some woody debris, they prefer really flat beaches. And that's because they are so small that any sort of indent or depression within the sand is actually a little hoof for them, despite the fact that there are birds. They are more so little trotters along the beach. Um, and so any sort of depression, again, is a really difficult not only for the adults, but also for the chicks that are much smaller. So as we're wrapping up our ecological component of this presentation, we are going to address the development. And I do want to recognize a cultural context that Native people have resided and utilized beach and dune environments since this time immemorial. We strongly encourage Oregonians and others to learn about the people indigenous to Oregon. And we really encourage you to explore their websites and um, seek their stories and their information through their sources. As we talk more so about recent development history, the Oregon coast has become popular, especially within recent decades, in which case we're starting to see more and more growth happening as well as more and more development. And with development, we tend to commonly see a lot of vegetation be removed in order to put in buildings or homes. However, with the removal of a lot of that vegetation, we can actually see the sediment get displaced and then all of a sudden we don't have that stability or foundation underneath some of that development or surrounding that development. Some of the solutions to that was putting in jetties and although they have been helpful, um, we can definitely see the kind of change in impact that they, that they provide on our Oregon coastline, but also they're not the simple or single solution. As some of you may be familiar with, there was a town called Bay Ocean that was trying to go with the approach of putting in a jetty. However, this town was short-lived because it only had funds for half of the jetty. So in 1906, this town was established on that little peninsula within Telamo County. Um, and they started to see the sand erode away from underneath their township. So they decided to put in a jetty. Again, they only had funds for half of it, and they put it on the northern half of that waterway, just up in the upper half of that image. Now, with that development, we actually saw a lot of accretion or gathering of sediment on the northern half. Therefore, a lot of the sediment was eroding away from the actual township, and the buildings started to fall into the sea as early as the 1920s with a record of the last building falling into the sea in 1971. So with factoring that in as far as the importance of the ecology of beaches and dunes and knowing how much has changed and what kind of impact development can have, we have goal 18 that helps provide a lot of guidelines or implement certain policies 
as we continue with development and it helps us determine if whether or not certain development should be prohibited. So one of the components to goal 18 is the need to conduct and collect inventory. And that's to help us identify areas all along the coast. So we can actually say, this area is a beach, this area is a dune, this area may be some other type of marshland. And we have partners such as those with Dogami who are helping us update a lot of mapping. The image on the left-hand side, that is from the 1970s. As you might be able to see, it's not really the most user-friendly. A lot of the landmarks are identified using abbreviation with letters. And we have this now updated version on the right-hand side. They've already completed with Tillamook County and they are continuing in order to cover the whole Oregon coastline. So this can be used by experts, by cities, by counties, as we continue on with development and to assess the areas of whether or not um, certain type of development should or should not be occurring, or if there needs to be certain rules and regulations to that. So those policies are set in for land use because we want to protect and conserve as well as restore resources. And we just want to make sure that our beautiful and unique coastline is available, not only to us now, but for future generations. And so along with that, we have some requirements when it comes to development. I mentioned earlier about shoreline armoring. For those who might be a little bit less familiar with what that definitively is, it's a layer or protective mound of stones randomly placed to prevent erosion or scouring of a structure or embankment. Um, now, there are some benefits. Again, it has that hard, hard surface. So a lot of that wave action can be reflected to neighboring or adjacent areas. And again, those beach profiles continue to be reduced and then they'll become less accessible to people. Therefore, shoreline armoring is actually only permitted for older developments that were completed prior to 1977. Another process that Goal 18 um, implements with some guidelines is dune grading. This would happen in order to remove sand, um, remove sand from the crest of the dune to prevent inundation. Hopefully some of you can see there's actually a house in the right picture. <laughs> we only see the roof. Um, but again, there's a lot of different guidelines for this because without the dunes, we can actually see those erosion and flooding protection qualities be compromised. So when it comes to dune graining, you're actually only allowed to do it on the four dune. And before anything's even done, I mean, dune management plan or dune grading management plan needs to be written out and submitted, not only to the city, not only to the county, but also to the state. And so some things need to be factored in whenever it comes down to for dune grading. First and foremost, that no matter how much dune grading you might want to do, the dune has to be at least more than four, at least four feet over the base flood elevation. And that base flood elevation is established by FEMA. When dune grading is occurring, you need to factor in the entire area. So don't worry, it's not like your neighbor's allowed to just do dune grading and that poses you in a comparable position, you do have to factor an entire area that's going to be influenced by that grading process. Also with that, you need to identify areas of buildup. So while there may need to be grading in one spot right next to it, or even just a little bit further down, could use some of that sediment because that sand or sediment is not allowed to leave the four dune or beach system. And then, Last but not least is the you need to factor in stabilization measures. So with dune grading, again, we start to compromise the flood protection and erosion qualities of those dunes. So we still wanna make sure that they'll be put. And one of the stabilization measures might be planting. However, you can't just say, we're gonna try this. You have to share how you're gonna follow through with that process. And if that process isn't successful, what are your alternatives? And so the state works really hard to protect, conserve, and restore the natural resources that we all really appreciate and adore here on the Oregon coast. And I'd like to share what you can do about it. 
So first and foremost, we ask you folks that if you come across any sort of cultural resources, artifacts, or remains, please do not touch them. It's actually underneath state law that you're not allowed to move them or touch them. However, you can take pictures of them and note the location, but we ask that you only share this information with the State Historic Preservation Office. You can send that information to the following email and they will contact you as far as what to do. And their role is to help ensure that whatever artifact remains or cultural resources found is brought back to the appropriate tribe or individual. More things that you can do, um, please stick to designated paths. They're established for a reason, predominantly for your safety, as well as allowing you access to your favorite areas. But you can also see in the image more on the left-hand side that some folks have decided to create their own path. Now, this causes a lot of vegetation to eventually wear away or die. You know, it takes years to grow and just takes a foot in order to go. Um, so we ask you to please stick to those designated paths for many reasons. And one of those could be is there may be restricted areas in those new pathways some people are trying to make. There could be new um, grass growth going on. There could be a high erosion area or there could be our cute little snowy plovers. I don't know if you folks can see the little chick actually beneath the adult chick, uh, the adult snowy plover in the image on the right hand side. Um, so again, we might, we ask you to respect those established lines saying not to go into certain areas. More things you can do is you can actually be part of the science or part of the community science. DLCD actually helps manage the Oregon King Tides project. This event occurs within the winter as far as during the daylight hours. Uh, King Tide is the highest of the high tides. This occurs due to the alignment of the sun, moon, and earth. And we can see it going encroaching up onto certain areas that maybe you won't see it happen throughout the rest of the year. And now keep in mind, the Oregon coastline, 362 miles long. That's really difficult for a state agency to monitor. So we actually do rely upon the community to help us take pictures and providing us with ground truth for our long-term monitoring for us to better know and understand what is happening to the Oregon coastline. So that if there's any sort of policies that we need to update and change, or if there's certain areas that we might need to focus on of utmost importance and just ensure that this coastline is available for future generations. So we're going to conclude my portion. We do have two extra special bonus guests for you. However, if you have any particular questions or wanna know a little bit more, we will have some time at the end of this presentation. However, I'm gonna to refer to you some contact information. If you have some really particular questions of your area, um, you have my contact information. We have Rhiannon Bazaar, she's our coastal shore specialist, as well as Meg Breed, who's our coastal policy specialist. And with that, I'm going to open up the floor to Kevin Hurtcamp. He's the Oregon Shores Coordinator for the Oregon Parks and Recs Department. So if you mind giving him a little round of applause. Sorry, first technical issue of the night. Oh, <laughs> good evening. My name is Kevin Hurtcamp. I am the Ocean Shores Coordinator with Oregon Parks and Recreation, as I was introduced. Um, tonight, my role here is just going to provide you an overview of the Ocean Shore program through um, OPRD and kind of what it presents out there. What I would offer up, if you want to hear more about our program, please reach out. We can set up a time to meet with your organization or whatnot to provide that information. So Oregon's beaches have been protected since 1967 under the Beach Bill, and under that um, in 2000, by around 2000, OPRD was given the responsibility to manage the ocean shore state recreation area. And in, within that recreation area to protect it for all the natural resource values and recreational values that it holds. The recreation area itself is really a combination of public and private ownership that's overlapped with the ocean shore uh, recreation easement. It was established through surveys back in 1967, kind of establishing the difference between the upland edge and the ocean shore 
But then there is also a clause that says as the ocean shore erodes, it moves east to the line of um, established upland vegetation. So that can make things a little bit complicated out on the ground. A uh, couple of scenarios here where you have both kind of eroding situation on the left and accreting situation on the right. Really the takeaway on this is there's a lot of different public ownership and private ownership on the beach. And just because you see sand or just because you see beach grass doesn't mean you are actually on or off the ocean shore. It's based on definitions that are in statute and it can be really complicated uh, when you're out there. And really what we recommend is if you're, if you live on or near the ocean shore, if you work on or near the ocean shore, give us a call if you're planning on doing any work so we can have this discussion and work through the complexities. And so an example of this is scenario here where the green is property lines uh, for the sake of the demonstration. The red is a statutory vegetation line and the yellow line is the current line of vegetation. So where it's eroded back to. And if you notice in the middle, there's a concrete uh, step or pad there. Well, whether or not that was being proposed or has been exposed by recent erosion, it would actually need approval from OPRD because it's within the Ocean Shore State Recreation Area, within the protected area. And we'd have to do the evaluation on that. And the other one is when you've got an accretion. In this scenario, there's a couple of uh, a couple of scenarios in here where you've got the lots extending beyond the SVL out onto the beach and others where the tax lots may end right at the statutory vegetation line, which is again, the red line. But what you'll see is the, the blue circles and rectangles represent encroachments. And those are where the upland landowner has built might be a fire pit might be a picnic bench might be some landscaping or a flagpole out past that statutory vegetation line those are actually encroachments and one thing to note is the public can actually access through that easement for recreation up into those areas and even up to the back of those homes and so it's something that needs to be edu landowners need to be educated about when especially when they're developing or building something to know you know maybe can control that through setbacks and be back front of so you can have a private backyard um, and also not being able to do the, the work that they want to do out on the ocean shore. So some of the things we, we regulate first is construction related activities. That's one of the main places we'll get engaged. And that could be for doing shoreline erosion protection. It could be construction equipment on the beach or access ways, um, grading sand to improve access at some of our public access ways that are out there and a lot of various other um, construction related activities that people want to do on the beach. We also get engaged when there's dune management or dune restoration, and that might include mowing or uh, brush cutting, those type of things. Those are prohibited and regulated activities, or even signing. Um, and for example, the top right, somebody has a no trespassing sign. Well, you can't prevent the public from going on to the, the public easement. And that's that's what that signage is, is getting at. Um, natural product removal, wood, sand, cobbles, algae, those type of things. Currently, we do allow for some personal use. Um, we do not have any commercial use of those, uh, no commercial permits that we're issuing. And then we have things like non-traditional uses or special uses where this might include primarily events um, where there's more than 50 people gathering um, or other non-traditional activities that you wouldn't just put in as that's a normal recreational activity. So kind of jumping back to the construction projects that we call alteration projects. We do have a very formal permitting process for those, and there has to be a, a defined need or a, a benefit to the public. And the proposed alternative has to be the option that has the least impact to the ocean shore resources. And so that's the one thing we find it very challenging to work with uh, applicants because we get projects later on and we have to kind of go back and say, hey, let's talk about these other ways that you could actually you know, make this meet your needs while protecting the ocean shore. And that includes the, the four points that are listed up there, um, as well as several other factors. One th because of the complexity, one of the things we encourage folks is to reach out to us early on in the process uh, so that we can have those discussions before design happens. And then if you're submitting an application at least six months in advance so that we can work through the process. Um, while our normal review process is only 60 days from the receipt of a complete application, we find that it typically takes longer trying to work through all the different steps and processes um, to get a complete application and get everybody through the process. And why do we do that review? Well, part of it is just to look at the construction related impacts, not just 
you know, somebody wants to put in a, a stairway or put in a revetment, but how are they going to do that? In this example, uh, basically you've got the construction equipment coming in from the right-hand side going to the left-hand side of the photo, but it's crossing several private property owners. It's crossing a state park. It's impacting a couple public access ways as well as a very popular beach that has special events uh, scheduled for it during the summer. And so working through a lot of those details, because what you end up with is things like the top picture where the contractor graded from the bluff to the beat or to the surf. And really the only place for the public to walk was either in the surf or right down the middle, which actually went through the construction area. And so that's really blocking north south access or at least not providing safe public access to the project or down in the bottom left, having equipment and materials right at public access ways leads to a safety issue as well as kind of confusion for the public. How do they get out there to and from the beach? And on the bottom right, keeping the equipment where it's supposed to be. Uh, in this scenario, somebody decided to go outside their construction area and into an area that happened to be closed for uh, plover nesting at the time. So it's really just working through these projects to make sure we're having this discussion and, and being able to check up on these projects and make sure the beaches are safe for the public. So our program itself um, is expanding. Uh, our, the agency is putting a little few more resources into the ocean shore. We currently have 10 uh, beach rangers up and down the coast that patrol the beach, work with, interact with the public, do a lot of things like the pets on leash, those types of, uh, you know, kind of basic park use uh, contacts. But then in, at headquarters, there are currently um, three of us. We're bringing on another permit specialist next month or two. Um, I deal with primarily program development as well as some permits. Tyler Blanchett, he's our permit specialist. And then Laurel Hillman, she will be more of the planning and natural resource uh, management type of, of work. So if you have any questions, you can please reach out to any one of us. Excellent. Thank you, Kevin. And now uh, we do have one other guest speaker. We have Carl Hendrickson. He is the Sea Level Rise Adaptation Fellow for DLCD. And without further ado, pass the floor over to him if you all don't mind giving him a little applause. Good afternoon, everyone. Thanks for joining and holding on uh, for the final event. My name is Carl Hendrickson. As Alyssa mentioned, I'm a NOAA Coastal Management Fellow uh, focusing on sea level rise. So per my fellowship, I've been working in Clatsop County, um, working with communities and jurisdictions there to hear from community members about important assets that might be at risk from sea level rise. Uh, when I say important assets, we mean things beyond uh, major infrastructure and roads that we can hear about from the county, uh, things like your favorite grocery store or beach access point or park where you meet up with your friends, um, things that as a community you would hate to lose to sea level rise. Uh, that's what we're trying to hear about as part of this project. Uh, after we've held those workshops, I'm working to prioritize those assets. Everything is really important to everyone, and we want everything to get improved, but we have to place some things first. So we're working to prioritize those based on natural resources and human uses and emergency management. Um, so below, we have a picture of our workshop process uh, where we are showing maps of sea level rise and asking people to identify where things are there. As I mentioned, my fellowship project is specific to Clatsop County, uh, but DLCD as a whole is releasing these materials uh, to the public for the whole state to use. Um, so we've been holding workshops, like I said, up there. Uh, we're especially excited about those last two at Astoria High School and the Clatsop Community College. Uh, we're doing outreach to some of the younger population at a lot of our outreach events. Um, we reached a lot of homeowners and older folks in the community, but we want to make sure that we're reaching the youth um, who are going to be growing up with sea level rise and really seeing that change take place. Um, so while my project is specific to Clatsop, we'd love to do outreach again to high schools and colleges here at the Hatfield Center um, throughout the Oregon coast. Um, I'll take a moment to show this is our sea level rise viewer you can find online at the Oregon Coastal Atlas dot net. Um, and you can see here Yukuna Bay going up. Um, on the left on the coast, we see sea level rise hazards related to erosion and storm waves so where wave action can occur. Uh, but going all the way up the estuary, what that's showing is 1.5 feet of sea level rise plus a 100 year storm event. And so anything pink going up the estuary is showing where that risk is. And then you see some uh, cross hatched areas 
those are not at risk of sea level rise, but everything around them is. And so if you're an island surrounded by um, sea level rise, it's kind of just as bad. So we consider those areas as well. Um, so that's sort of what we're looking like here in Yaquina. And I know with the recent estuary management plan, they're starting to consider sea level rise into the future. Uh, so with that, I just wanted to give a little introduction to my project. Um, and if you're interested in hearing more about sea level rise or uh, reaching out, please do so. I listed my name and Rhiannon and Meg, who Alyssa introduced, um, are my project mentors. So thank you very much. All right. Thank you. Oh, go ahead. I was just going to say, uh, we've got time now for uh, questions. We're going to bounce back and forth between those questions online and those in the room. Feel free to let us know who you're asking the question to, um, and we'll just kind of jump back and forth. Roseanne, do we have any questions online? Okay, for folks online, if you put any questions you might have into the chat box, we'll work through it. How about folks in the room? Any questions? All right, give me a second as I run around. Thank you all so much for your wonderful presentations. I have a question for Alyssa. I was wondering if you know why the European beach grass aids in dune height, whereas the American beach grass aids in dune width, if there was any reason behind that. Excellent question. I wouldn't say that I exactly know nor observed as far as why the be European beach grass helps with height while the American beach grass helps with width. Um, it's a little bit hard to see within those pictures, but actually they do have a little bit of a blade, uh, or at least, you know, the main part of it, like a little bit of a difference. Um, and so that could be a component that it helps with um, dune height in one, in one aspect or from one species versus dune width. Um, that's why we focus on the ligules because to kind of say like, well, the, for the European beach grass, the blade's a little bit wider. That's a little bit hard to identify compared to looking at the ligual length. Excellent question though. All right, another question in the room. Thanks, also a grass question. Are there any efforts to eradicate the introduced species and propagate the native species? I was a little surprised to see that there was a hybrid version that was introduced in 2012. That seems fairly recent, but there must be um, a reason behind that. It seems like historically we've just had trouble with um, introduced species of any kind. They always tend to take over. So, <laughs> correct. No, it, it's excellent question. Um, so the hybrid itself that wasn't like actively introduced that happened because of the two introduced species. Um, and as far as efforts to remove the introduced species, the fact that they have now a very important role on Oregon's coastline now, as far as establishing that dune height and dune width much more successfully than the Native American, um, the Native American dune grass, excuse me, getting a little bit tongue tied with those. Um, the idea with eradication, you also have to factor in that that's not a simple nor easy task. It is very expensive. It does require heavy machinery. And of course, once you remove that grass species, we have to hope that like the native grass will fulfill that role and keep the dune stabilized. However, um, that native American dune grass is slow to establish. It's not as successful. Fortunately, it's just become outcompeted. Um, and another component too, sometimes with that eradication process, it may consist of a lot of pesticides, which, you know, that's a whole nother component that, you know, would take a lot of management and regulations and assessment with that. Um, so, oh yeah. So Kevin's gonna also going to follow up on that. So one thing, if there is some restoration going typically with like the forest surface map, but as Lisa said, they're doing pretty extensive dune, um, dune grading and replanting and vegetation control after that. But if you go back, I was looking for your old, there you go, the old, the old photos. So I'll just point out on this one here, if you notice, there is no vegetation. Our dunes historically along the Oregon coast had very limited vegetation in them. So if we go back to a natural state, that means removing the vegetation, which then, the dunes historically were also very mobile. So they would, 
all those developments would then be under sand. You saw the picture of the house buried. That's what all of those would look like. And so that invasive grass provides a very important structural component to protect the developed piece. And if you take that out, then you get the pushback from the developed side of it where, you know, where do you balance that line? So it's, it's not an easy answer. And because it's so widespread, um, there are several people looking at how to propagate native plant seeds um, because really they're not right now, they're currently not commercially viable. And there, and so there are, a, there's a seed bank working, I think in partnership with OSU NRCS that are looking at that. Um, but we're probably still a few years away from actively looking at how do we replace this with something more, more native and more sustainable long-term. All right, it looks like we had a question online. Go ahead, Rosanna. Is it true that ticks tend to live on the beach grasses? And uh, this person is curious what insect life there is on those grasses. Excellent, excellent question. Um, um, ticks in particular, I'm not familiar with. Um, but you know we can just generally see other types of um, insects. I can't really pinpoint the particular species, but when we just generally think about the food web or an ecosystem, we do have those uh, primary consumers, um, and we of course see some other wildlife among the grass, and they need to eat something other than the vegetation. Um, so I wish I can give you more information with that. Um, feel free to follow up with any of those other contacts that I that we provided with an email um, and we'll hopefully get back to you shortly and provide you more details or at least a resource to look further into that. But excellent question. Alyssa, can you go back to your um, contact slide? And then we yeah. got a question in the room. So this is to uh, follow up on the grasses question. Bring it. <laughs> is there... A when, when dunes erode or slump and there's exposed sand, is there any program available to acquire any of these dune grasses, beach grasses, to be able to replant? Is that recommended, suggested, anything like that? Excellent question. Um, so it is recommended for like coastal homeowners to help with planting. As far as um, Kevin mentioned, it being commercially available, there that's still a working progress. Um, there are some nurseries scattered along the Oregon coast that are essentially doing a little bit of a trial to see what type of vegetation might help promote or help with stabilizing dunes. Um, however, you know, this is a like a long-term process and what might be working well in the nursery, we still have to assess as far as if it's gonna work out in nature. Um, but we, we we're, from DLCD's perspective, we do encourage more grasses to help with the dune stabilization because of the important role that they serve. As a follow-up, um, there are other states that provide, for example, free trees to property owners that want to vegetate their property, et cetera. Do you think there will be a day when the state or one of the agencies is providing, you know, a flat of dune beach grass or whatever to be able to be planted in eroded areas? I couldn't necessarily answer that specifically. I mean, none of us know what, what's going to be out in the future. And that always takes time, money and, and initiative and perspectives on, you know, these are non-native. Some, some people call them invasive, which I mean, they really have. They've taken over the entire coast. They're kind of a, a, to some extent, that balance between the, I'll say the necessary evil. So I don't know that would there necessarily be any promotion of it, but, um, you know, there, there's, I know that OSU, uh, Degami, um, OPRD, DLC, we're all working and talking about a lot of things. What is the history or what is the future of the Oregon coast look like and how are we going to be dealing with that? And how does non-native species play into that? How does dune restoration play into that? And you know, as well as just how does shoreline stabilization and those type of things fit into that? Because I think your your question earlier about with the dune grass, I mean, when or when the dunes fail, a lot of that's during high surf events. And so that vegetation is getting washed away. Um, and what does remain will reestablish if it's there. And just because a block has fallen off, it'll it'll regrow. They they sprout from very, you know, very limited rootstock um, that's there. They'll they'll reestablish. Um, so they're again, as far as 
having a crystal ball, I couldn't say that whether or not we'd ever do that. What I do know has happened in the past for uh, individuals who've needed to find grass for planting is they've been able to harvest it from intact areas and get permissions to go out and basically take plugs and whatnot along, but they're still hiring somebody and they're still working through the process to get those collection. All right, looks like we got another question online. Where are the dunes most able to move in a natural state in Oregon at this time, Florence? Oh, excellent question. I mean, yeah. it- I, I would think the dunes NRA is gonna be the, the place that's probably got the most active dunes more natural just because the vegetation is being managed more probably as it was historically just sorry um but yeah the a lot of the a lot of the coast is is basically vegetated dunes so really the dunes nra is the only area where you see a lot of the open sand all the way from the beach into the um, dune complexes so the nra is the natural na natural recreational area excuse me <laughs> so yes florence reedsport goose bay that area <laughs> great got another question in the room during the uh, discussion of sea, sea level rising, you mentioned 1.5 feet plus a, a severe storm. Um, why 1.5 feet? Um, and do you have any contemplation as to how long we have between now and when the sea rises, 1.5 feet? Yeah, that's a great question. Uh, and a bit of a philosophical debate around sea level rise communication. Um, do you give people a sea level rise level and tell them that it'll be here between X and Y years? Or do you give them a year and tell them that sea level will be between X and Y? Um, and it's challenging to do. It's challenging to be right because, as Kevin said, we don't have a crystal ball. Um, we chose 1.5 feet because it's a reasonably understandable level. Um, and we expect it to occur in an amount of time that is tangible, like 30-ish years, similar to a mortgage on a home for people who live on the coast. Um, so that's sort of where 1.5 feet came from. I know Noah has sliding bars, and you can look from one feet all the way up to 10. Um, we chose that for ease. And then the 100-year storm is, again, sort of a, an understandable event. There are large storms, and we get that the water comes further. And so we chose that. Um, I'll say that 100-year storms are becoming a little more often than 100 years at this point, too. Um, so that level should be taken with a grain of salt. All right, got some questions, I'll come back. Thanks for those great talks. So just to follow up on that question, if in roughly 30 years, we might have a 1.5 sea level rise, it seemed near graphic, like that would mean the beaches were fully covered in the image that you showed. Do you talk about a loss of Oregon's beaches in the future under climate change? And uh, how is that received when you talk about it, if so? Or or do you talk about the movement of beaches inland? Like what's the future of our beaches under climate change? Big question. Yeah, that's another big one. Wow, um, a great question. So, you know, beaches and dunes and, and tides are not static. So just where, where that line is, um, you know, I'm not exactly sure if that's mean high or high water or if that's mean mean water so I, i'm not exactly certain where that line is but certainly as sea level rises um the beach will get smaller or it will go inland um and so we are discussing that um and in a lot of places uh, there's not a lot of room between going inland and going upland um so it's definitely something that we're considering i i don't know that i have a great answer for what we're doing about it um we're working with communities to see how the impacts are real to them and talk about shoreline properties. Do you have anything to add? Yeah, yeah, I guess I would just, you know, basically reiterate everything you said that that's one of the things we're starting to have the dialogue on with, especially things like shoreline protection structures. And when you harden that interface with a dune, you're preventing that, that beach from moving inland, which protects the developed um, structures that are out there in the neighborhoods. But that does also lock the easter the edge of the beaches and so as that as that water level moves up and moves in you get a narrowing of the beaches and eventually an inundation of the beach and then you get a steeper more drop off you end up basically having open water um you know if, if things get really bad and so you have that gradual degradation over time so the question is without having a crystal ball how do we deal with the scenarios that are in front of us today where somebody's house is going to fall in or a whole community's at risk or something of that nature and 
looking forward and saying, what will be the cost to the beach in the future? None of us really know. And so there are a lot of active dialogue starting. Um, probably more to come in the next few years. It's amazing what the science has done even the last few years. So everybody's starting to look at it now. I will add to that, that one of our collaborators, you might've heard their acronym DOGAMI or DOGAMI, D-O-G-A-M-I. Um, they have a lot of data and information as far as what has happened. So we, with their data and their information, we can have an idea of what kind of changes have occurred within either a short amount of time, a long amount of time, as far as as far back they have records. So we can at least get a general idea of seeing like what kind of changes are occurring from the events that we know of right now. And if that can help give us a little bit more of an idea of a prediction with some other events such as sea level rise. And I highly recommend if this is something you're interested in is exploring their website because they have mounds and mounds of data as well as images. Um, I'm hopefully producing a product within uh, within the next couple of months to help make a user-friendly story map so people can more so see that uh, with a simple display, but also provide a lot of those resources. So if you want to do a deep dive, you know where to find that information. And, and I think I'll add to that too, like on Dakamis, they're working on like coastal erosion maps and again, documenting that history, but also trying to understand what's happening and what are called littoral cells, which is very simply, it's kind of a two points on the, on the, along the beach where the sand kind of stays within. And so it'll move South and North as different weather patterns happen. And so you'll get erosion in one area and, and accretion in the other, and then it may switch in a different weather pattern, but there's also a sand repository out under the water. And so each of those littoral cells is different. And so the effects of climate change and development and are, are going to be different in every single one of those littoral cells. And that's where we have to rely on the folks that have the expertise to look at those and give us that background of what is out there, what is the development going to potentially, or what is going to develop in the future as, as sea level rise happens. Excellent. I think we have one more. Yeah, I have a question on um, beach accesses. In our development, um, with some of the recent storms, especially last year, some of those beach accesses have been, I will say, compromised to the point where either they're not usable or maybe perhaps they're not safe. And so as a community or as a, what are you allowed to do to, you know, to make those accesses safe? And, or, you know, if some improvement needs to be made to them. So um, it's kind of a general question, but yeah, any insight would be helpful. Yeah, so there's there's several, I'll say, kind of levels of access out there, right? You've got the, the developed access points, which are maintained or managed by a local or government en entity. You've got kind of, I'll call them community access points where it may be a developed, um, you know, homeowners association or something of that nature where they have something they actively maintain, but again, it's really an established point. And you have kind of these, I'll say expectations where it's still user done, but they're not actively maintained, but they're a very heavily used area. And then what we have along the, mo the coast, and this is for the most part, there's a lot of user created trails and there's thousands of them. Um, you probably have all been up and down them. There's no way as an agency we can manage or maintain all of those, um, and nor in many cases there's, a, I'll say, a desire. We want to encourage access, but as Alyssa said, some of these are just wandering through the dunes and maybe doing more damage than they're doing good. So as far as those, if they're a formal access point, those are things where, you know, I'm always working with our staff and city and county uh, managers to try to figure out how, how can we maintain that access and do that. When it's the, um, you know, I'll call them, say, the community access points or the a primary point that's maybe not an established or, you know, a designated access point, we'll work with, with folks on that, try to figure out what options are there. Sometimes that might be a community-driven project, and we can talk through based on what's there. A lot of the user-based trails, that's where usually there's not much going on. There's not, I don't want to say there's not support, but we can talk about it. Um, but really there's maybe not a lot of options and that is very common on the Oregon coast to have those trails erode and, and move every year. Um, and so again, every site is unique and we would need to talk about it. Um, got several places along the coast where I'm having that discussion with, with folks right now. And 
Some cases during the summer, it rebuilds with sand blowing in and it's relatively safe, but then the winter it erodes and it's a cliff. Some of that is um, a factor of some of the um, historic actions that have been had in the area, or even some of the establishment of beach grass that can affect that dune shape and create more of those scarps and other things. So it may not be a simple answer at any given site. Um, some of, again, our cliff faced, um, cliff back dunes, um, you know, those types of things, they can be very challenging to get an act, keep and maintain an access point down there. So again, every site is unique along the Oregon coast and we'd have to talk about it, but there are options. I would, would say, you know, let's talk about it and, you know, see what you want to do and what, what we can do. It might be something as simple as, Hey, go take some hand tools down there with the community group. And then this is what we can figure out to, you know, being able to, um, work with heavy equipment, but, that sliding scale is going to depend on what the resource values are in that area and what what options are really allowable there. All right. Can you put up your contact again, uh, Kevin, for folks? And then I think we're going to wrap it up there, everyone. Um, if anybody has additional questions for our speakers, um, they might stick around for just a few minutes. Um, so you can come up here and ask them. Um, either that or you can contact them online. For everybody here in the room and everybody online, thank you so much for being part of the Hatfield um, Science on Tap this evening. And one more thank you for our presenters, please. For folks online, we're going to end the presentation now. Thanks for joining us.